My name is Leslie Booker, and most people call me by my last name, which is just Booker. And uh, a few years ago, someone asked a dear friend of mine about that, and she said that Leslie is the woman who will cook you a four course meal and invite you into their home and have this really, you know, this very really warm, fuzzy home experience. And Booker is the one who's out in the street getting shit done. And uh, at this stage in my life, I think I have fallen kind of softly somewhere in the middle between those two. Um, I spent my formative years living in Japan. I know that Christopher is visiting us from Japan this evening. And I mostly grew up in Northern Virginia, uh, the suburbs of Washington, DC, um, where I was raised by Reagan loving Republicans, also known as my biological parents. <laughs> Um, I lived in New York for almost 20 years, and then um, I gave up home for a year and a half to go forth and to explore um, nomadacy in, in, in my practice. I tried living in Connecticut for a minute, did not enjoy that. And about two and a half months ago, my girlfriend and I moved to Connecticut so that we could vote in a swing state. Um, and I really love the teachings of the Buddha. I really do. And every year I take an aspect of the Dharma to study, to live by, to practice, to teach. And for 2020, the practice that I was working with, that I am working with, are the paramis, these 10 perfections or attainments. The paramis are not part of the classical list that we know of, but they're actually um, 10 qualities of heart and mind that the Brahman Sumedha perfected over some say eons and eons of years in different lifetimes and different incarnations of being before he was born into the body of Siddhartha Gautama, who would one day sit under a Bodhi tree and be the Buddha that we know of today. And so these teachings of generosity, virtue, renunciation, wisdom, energy, patience, which I'm still working on, um, truthfulness, resolve, metta, and equanimity are sprinkled throughout the Buddha's teachings. But again, collectively, they're known as the paramis. And what I love about them is that they they're not meant to, um, they're not about sitting around and navel gazing, um, but they're meant to be known, to be explored and practiced in relationship with not only ourselves, but others around us in the world. And with all that we're living through as a global community in this collective trauma that we are experiencing, Closing my eyes and going inward has not always been the best medicine for me during these past nine, 10 months. And so I've really been living my practice off the cushion, exploring the volume, the weight and the depth of my practice as I live the paramis in my, my day-to-day life. So the paramis begin with generosity and virtue, specifically speaking of the five precepts that remind us that knowing how deeply our lives are intertwined, that we undertake the precept to protect life, to be generous, to care for my sexuality and that of others, to be mindful and careful with my speech, and to watch the intoxicants that cloud my heart and mind, including news media, social media, and hate speech in general. And the paramis end with two out of the four Brahma Viharas, these heart practices of metta and equanimity. And that's where I'll begin our conversation this evening. So, I'm not historically a meta girl. Like some people really love meta, they gravitate to it, it's their thing. I'm a compassion girl. 
And so I found Metta through the back door of compassion. And, you know, as they say, you know, we teach what we need to learn. And so it's something that has become part of my teaching practice and part of my, my lived experience. And it took me a while to understand um, that the teachings of the Buddha, the Dharma, that I needed to find my own way um, to understand them in a way that made sense for me and for all of us, you know, based on our social locations. We're going to hear of the Dharma, we're going to experience these teachings in completely different ways. And so, like many of you, I um, learned metta as a concentration practice through the phrases, may I be happy, may I be healthy, may I be safe, and may I live with ease. And for a long time, um, you know, living in New York for um, about 12 years, I shared practice of yoga and meditation with um, really vulnerable populations. And so even though my heart and the entirety of my body was feeling um, these phrases, exploring these practices by using the phrases got me kind of stuck in my head, even though I was really feeling them through my body. And I got really caught up, you know, like how could I say may you be happy to a kid who's locked up in jail and away from his family? How could I say may you be healthy to someone who's living with HIV and AIDS or may you be safe to someone who's experiencing homelessness or may you live with ease for someone who was living with addiction and was detoxing. And then I got a chance to read and chant the Karaniya Metta Sutta, the Buddha's words on loving kindness. And this one uh, piece of it where it says, so with a boundless heart, should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. And I was like, yeah, that's how I know metta. That's how I experience this practice. It wasn't these phrases I was trying to memorize in my head. It was this expression of unbounded, unbounded love that was above me and below me. And I did feel free from hatred and ill will. And so that was what my experience was. And with that, I realized that what was missing for me was this embodiment, the permission to embody metta, to embody loving kindness and benevolence and friendliness. I could really experience this practice as a full felt sense experience. And one of the people that I'm, I mentor recently said to me that they also had a really challenging time accessing metta at the beginning of their practice. And metta moved from the scene that was undermining their practice to the thing that became the underpinning of their practice. And so that's kind of where um, I've been. And it's been really useful for me to look at metta, to experience metta, to share metta as a practice of having um, two, two wings, one of benevolence and kindness and friendliness, and the other of this fierce protection that prevents me, my heart and my mind from being colonized by the three poisons of greed, hatred and delusion. And so, that's my experience, my practice, my understanding of how I, I know metta. And when something's really, really important in the Buddha's teachings, he tends to repeat it over and over and over again. And so this brings us to equanimity. So equanimity is this other quality of heart and mind 
and it makes an appearance in the Fort Hart practices of the Brahma Viharas. It shows up in the seven factors of awakening, the five powers of spiritual faculties, and in the paramis. And so equanimity is known to be um, a balancing factor in each of these groupings, balancing out faith and wisdom and energy and truthfulness and patience. It protects the heart from going into envy and it, it prevents um, the excitement of joy of mudita from becoming agitated. It protects compassion from moving into what some people call compassion fatigue, which is actually just pity. I really look at equanimity as being love and really clear boundaries and tenderness without attachment. And so equanimity is a practice of salvation. When I first met Philip Moffat, who's been my mentor for many years, he would always say in his teachings, um, <laughs> he would always say, now this breath is like this. And this breath is like this. And this breath is just like this. And I was always like, it's like, what, Philip? Finish your sentence. Like, I didn't understand <laughs> what he was saying. It's like, what? But he was speaking of being still and just noticing what is arising in that moment without grasping or clinging or wanting things to be any different what they are, to just be with this breath. And, you know, I thought about another early instruction that I got, you know, in my practice and one that I hold really dearly, and that's just to allow the Dharma to wash over you. So to not go bulldozing in trying to really understand it. I learned early on that, and what I was taught early on is that what is meant, what is meant to be known for me in that moment will eventually reveal itself when it is time for it to be revealed. And that that revealing is not possible in a body that is grasping and clinging and leading with my head. This wisdom emerges from a body that is rested and receptive and still. And that's really hard because we live in a culture that ask us to resp respond to every single emotion by either clicking a button or taking this pill or listening to this app. And equanimity is inviting us into stillness. It is asking us to, um, to be still. There's this expression, tatra majatata, and it means to stand in the middle. To stand in the middle. So standing in the middle of the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows. Standing in the middle of heartbreak and heart opening. Standing in the middle of this deep suffering and this extraordinary liberation that is possible through our practice. And so Thich Nhat Hanh says that life is both dreadful and wonderful. To practice meditation is to be in touch with both aspects. And so I really love that. That's understanding that life is dreadful, <laughs> you know, and it's wonderful and it's miraculous. So how do we stand in the middle with all that is arising around us, all that is coming at us, all that is challenging us? So equanimity is a practice of a fierce heart. 
it allows us to go directly into the fire to see what's present, what needs to be tended to. Equanimity is not afraid, it does not back down. It stays present to whatever is here. So how is our practice showing up off the cushion in the midst of this great suffering that we are experiencing as a global community? Are we going so internal in our practice that we're actually bypassing over what the felt sense of our body is asking us to pay attention to? Do we scream at people or wish them ill will because they don't share our same political views? Are we relying on the consult of wise friends or do we allow our hearts and minds to get intoxicated as we take in what we hear to be true? This is what it looks like when we leave our practice on the cushion, when we forget to bring it with us into our lived day-to-day -day experiences, when we are engaging with the world. We're engaging with dear friends and people who are, are difficult or challenging for us. This is what it looks like when we forget that we belong to each other and we think that our practice is only about our own personal liberation, forgetting that you know, we cannot be free until we all get free together. The poet and essayist, Audre Lorde, um, who self describes herself as black woman, lesbian, poet, warrior, mother. And so she so beautifully stood in the middle of all of those identities. Also really radical activist and beautiful artist. And she was able to stand in the middle of all of that with fierceness and integrity and love and beauty. And she says that the master's tools can never dismantle the master's house. And I think of the world that we live in and what we're facing each day and the tools and structures that allowed this current house that we're living in to be built. I think of what it would be like to tear down that house, <laughs> that house that was built on hate and oppression and fear and lies. What would it be like to tear down that house and to rebuild this new house? To pour a foundation of generosity and virtue to have these bricks made of metta that are both welcoming and friendly, but also are these fierce protectors. To have this roof made of equanimity. And so whatever hits this roof, whether it's winds or rains or snow or hail or bright sunlight, that this roof of equanimity protects all that's inside which is truthfulness and patience and joy that gets to dance all throughout this house. And so I'm gonna pause right there for a moment and just thank you for your kind attention. And I like to open up to something that my dear friend Bonnie Duran refers to as wisdom democracy. And so wisdom democracy is this opportunity for us to share our wisdom, to share our experiences. A lot of people call it Q&A, questions and answer, which I also really love. I feel like this is where, where um, we really begin to understand our practice. We really begin to understand our are um, these teachings where we can engage and be in conversation. And so I invite folks to 
Um, you can unmute yourself to ask a question or to share how these experiences of metta and equanimity and perhaps the paramis as a general statement have been showing up in your practice. How are you living these practices in your lived day-to-day -day experience? How are you meeting these challenging times with these practices? And so I invite folks to, um, to either um, to come online. It's kind of hard for me to manage reading and also trying to stay present. And so if there are some questions in there and maybe Tom, if you could go through and see if you can yeah. um, weed out if there's any questions. Sure. If you want to come online, that'd be great. Right. Another, another suggestion would be for people to raise their hand in the participants list. And that way we can see who uh, is ready to talk yeah. without everybody chiming in. That'd be great, Tom, thank you. Yeah, we've got about several pages of folks that would be great. So if you don't know how to raise your little blue hand, if you go into participants on the bottom of your screen, um, it'll give you an option to raise your hand. So we'll start with, I see that, um, that Marilyn has their hand raised. So hi, Marilyn. Goodness, oh goodness, girl. I'm, ah. doing, this. I'm doing this on the phone, I'm not real good at it. Yes, I raised my little blue hand because of just the question you raised. I love the meta, the loving kindness meditation. But I must admit, it is a continual challenge when I get to the part of sending loving kindness to the difficult people. Mm. Okay, so yeah, it feels good. I often don't think, and it's a good reminder to send loving kindness to myself and compassion. And it's so easy to send loving kindness to those you love, right? To those in your life, your friends, your family, whatever. And even, even the strangers in your life, you know, the grocery clerk, whatever. But when I get to the part of the difficult people, it is a challenge. And so is that just part of the meta practice? I mean, it's really <laughs> tough. So I would love to, if anybody else shares how they handle it or anything, and also to hear your feedback. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Marilyn, for that question. And yeah, you know, meta, all of these hard practices are not easy practices. You know, and this is why I think that the Buddha not only put, and I'm, I'm hearing some feedback. We make sure that we mute. Maybe, Tom, perhaps you can help me mute. Thank you. Yeah, okay, I've muted all. Thank you. And so, you know, like I said, when something's really important, the Buddha doesn't just leave it in one practice, he keeps bringing it back over and over again. And so metta is one of those practices that keeps showing up in all of the list. And I, um, and when we go to the difficult person, so I also want to invite another kind of practice. I, you know, it is difficult for a lot of us to hit, um, to hit the difficult person, <laughs> to offer meta to the difficult person. And so sometimes we're working with a, a person who might be too difficult. Maybe like there's some deeper work that needs to be happened. We want someone that just feels like a little bit of a tinge, like they kind of bug us, but we don't want to go to a person that has created so much harm that it's actually closing up our hearts. And I tend to practice metta by using this radiating metta practice, which doesn't have me use categories or words, but it allows me to feel into the felt sense in my body. And then like the Karaniya Metta Sutta says, to allow it to radiate out of my body. So above me, below me and all around me. And I find that to be a practice that's much more um, accessible for me um, to be inclusive to all beings. So thank you, Marilyn. So Chris P, Chris Perrier, Perrier, Perrier. Hey, hi, Booker. Can you hey. hi, Booker? Can you hear me? Okay. I can. Yes. Hello. Hi. Yeah, I. You really impressed me when I first met you in Simbala. Yeah. Uh, the retreat. It really uh, made a big impression on me, and 
one of the biggest impressions was uh, your steadfastness in Scylla in, and, and you gave a talk there where you talked about you were really strong on the precepts and Dilemma. in a very pra Dilemma. practical way, <laughs> yeah, a very practical way. You know, I, I've been listening to precepts for, you know, 30 years, but, you know, your sense of application of them. And one of the things that really hit me like a ton of bricks was when you said one of the precepts is don't take what is not given. Mm -hmm. And then you turned it around to say in the in the in the retreat, don't take uh, attention from people when they don't want to give it. Mm. I think this has very broad implications right across society where we are trying to get attention from others to seek approval and that sort of stuff. I wonder if you could speak a bit more about that idea of maintaining the precept of not stealing, well, basically it's the precept of not stealing. It sounds harsh to say that, but it's not stealing, not taking what is not given in today's climate, particularly today's climate. I'm, I'm, I'm in Western Australia, but in your country, um, I mean, I think it's relevant all over the world, but I'd be particularly interested in your view about this precept and keeping it uh, in the current climate. Yeah, thank you for that, Chris. It's good to see you again. And, you know, and since that time, you know, I'm constantly growing and learning. And again, like I mentioned, I'm finding practices and languaging that really resonates with me. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've actually, um, I've, ch I've been using these other forms of precepts that speak about, they're not in the negative, but actually in the positive. And so knowing how deeply our lives are intertwined, I undertake the precepts to protect life to be generous instead of not taking, um, to be careful with my speech, to protect my sexuality and to be, and to tend to the intoxicants that might cloud my heart and mind. And I found in, in just switching the language, I'm constantly thinking about not, not taking, but it, my energy is now about how can I be generous? How can I give, how can I share? How can I explore? And so it's shifted for me a little bit. And I'm really curious with changing the language when we're thinking about more about being generous as opposed to not stealing, does that feel or sound or, la or land differently for you? Uh, that really hits me because um, in my professional capacity, I'm I'm uh, basically in the I'm a therapist, and so often in our tradition we talk about getting rid of the negative with our clients and all that sort of stuff. But what the penny has really dropped, and it's very much fostered by what Rick's talking about. Hey, maybe it's a good idea to grow the positive. And what I found for myself personally is as I grow the positive, and in this case, moving I suppose from your analogy of not stealing to actually being generous. Um, then, then the desire to take uh, seems to be uh, less. I'm less attention seeking as I yeah. develop my generosity. So that's my personal experience of it. And yeah. professionally, the feedback I get is, yeah, it works. Grow the positive and the negative falls back in its intensity. So that's a very interesting take. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Chris. Thank you for that question. It's great to see you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, how about uh, Manohar and a and Tom, if there is anything um, coming up in the chat, you can also pop in and let me know. Thank you. Okay. So Ma Manohar, and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. And are you able to unmute yourself? So we'll pause and we'll go on to are you there? Or we'll go on to Rick. Manohar, can you hear? Yeah, I see they're in, they're in darkness now. So perhaps we can move on to Rick and then we can swing back through. Right. So Rick Kruger. Hi, Booker. Hey, how are you? I'm I'm doing amazingly well after your meditation and your talk. I just want to express my deepest appreciation. 
it's just so powerful. Just, um, I guess, sitting here with you in this, this community. Um, and it, it, it's like that for me on a kind of weekly Wednesday night, Wednesday night basis. <laughs> uh, one of the reasons I enjoy coming here. But um, it's really hard to, to take this experience that I have on a weekly basis out into life. And I think that's basically what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And for me, um, I'm not a particularly empathetic person. I, I know that about myself. And I'm just wondering, <laughs> what can I do on a kind of daily basis? I mean, I understand the power of intention. And I think that's probably a lot of it. You just, you have to, I need to intend to be curious. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's this whole business of generosity in a way. And it really kind of comes back to generosity basically because if I'm not being generous, then I'm basically being self-centered and, and selfish. And, you know, where's the empathy in that? Mm. Yeah. You know, it's that I don't, you know, I'm not interested in what you're feeling. I'm interested in what I can get, you know, mm. out of this, out of this relationship, out of this moment. So it's not as bad as I'm describing it. Sometimes it is, but not, not generally. Mm. I guess what I'm asking is, what can, what do you recommend to, I guess, develop a greater sense of empathy? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for being so transparent and honest about where you are. And, you know, in this practice, the way that a lot of um, these practices are taught in Western convert Buddhism is that it's all about like personal liberation. And we come here on whatever night that, you know, you go to your local sangha and it's really about this navel gazing. Let me sit and practice and do my own thing and I'm going to get free and forget about the rest of you. Mm. And that is not what the Buddha intentioned in these practices. Most of the teachings are about how we are in relationship with others, how we are responding to each other, how we are caring for each other, Mm. what we can do to protect each other and to be generous. Um, And so one thing that I recommend is to take one aspect of the teaching. So when you're saying, how can I be, you know, you know, you know, how can I be less apathetic? How can I go in the world and feel everything? You know, we move at the speed of trust, you know, we move at the speed of trust and, Mm. um, what do you mean by the speed? speed? Moving at the speed of trust means that, for whatever is blocking our heart from feeling a connection to other people, mm. that didn't just show up yesterday. Mm. There's been something that has been like kind of, and it's been probably a protector of mm. us. That's not about, you know, throwing out the baby with the bathwater or something that's been protecting our hearts. Mm. And it's protecting it's our hearts. It almost sounds, are you speaking to me? Or you're speaking in just general terms. It almost sounds like. As a, as a joke, I'm speaking to everyone, not just to you in general. Okay. And so when we're not able to feel compassion or empathy to other people, there's something that there's a block there. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of us, we put a block there to protect something. Mm -hmm. And so um, as long as it took to get there, it's going to take a little bit of time to begin to like peel back those layers. Mm -hmm. And so what I, you know, what I do every year is I pick one aspect of the Buddhist teachings um, and I stick with that. And sometimes it's a whole list but sometimes it's just one aspect of the list. And so maybe it's, you know, let me just be patient with myself. Like I'm not feeling, you know, you know, specific, you know, uh, you know, very like, you know, compassionate to other people, very empathetic to other people, but can I just be patient? Can I just be patient with that? And that can just be your practice. You know, it doesn't have to be a big, overhaul but just one little thing and it will and because the dharma kind of does this and swirls around you'll Mm. see how focusing on one aspect can begin to open up Mm. to all different kinds of aspects yeah all right thank you you're so welcome yeah um and so to yeah and and the person who we couldn't see had asked that their question be read do you see, I, 
Yeah. Yeah, I have it. Okay. Uh, that was Manahar. And his question was, how do you cope with your vulnerabilities when you feel anxious or depressed, even if it's infrequent and seldom only? So can we be always resilient and in equanimity, even when dealing with folks with delusions? So there's three different questions in there. <laughs> <laughs> there's like quite a few questions in there. Um, and so one thing, you know, there is a question about vulnerability. Um, and again, so the question is, how do we stay with our vulnerability when we feel like these strong emotions like depression and anxiety, I believe. Um, and that feels, um, I, I, I don't see vulnerability as something that's, um, like my vulnerability is me being truthful to how I'm showing up in the world. It's me being truthful about what I'm really uh, feeling what I'm really experiencing. So that's what it means for me to be vulnerable. Um, and I'm wondering if you mean vulnerable in a different way. And so um, I'm gonna put a pin in that question because I feel like I'm not, we might be speaking two different languages. But the second piece of that, Tom, was about equanimity with people that we don't agree with. Yeah, so can we be always resilient and equanimous, even when dealing f with folks with delusions. In theory, yes, this is what our practice is supposed to lead us towards. And I just wanna acknowledge how challenging it is, especially when we see people that are creating so much harm and hatred out there in the world. And so what it is, you know, I think of a, um, uh, equanimity as sort of being that space right before that second arrow hits, right? And so we see something happening, we hear these words, um, we feel like a sharp pain in our body because of something that was said or done. And then we pause right there and we just be with the discomfort, we be with the pain. Um, so that is the equanimity, right? The second arrow is why did he and he should have and why don't they know better? That's the second arrow that we don't want to get into because that gets into like these mental formations, right? And so equanimity allows us to pause for a moment and just say, oh, that, that hurts. And just to be present with what's arising. And it gives us a sacred pause to then respond from a place of wisdom. So we're not reactive in equanimity. It is a place of stillness in our practice. Thank you. And so, uh, okay, Judith. next is Judith Ann. Thank you, Tom. Hi. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I have as much of a question as I'm... I'm um, you, you were talking about democracy and people sharing and and... I guess one of the things I live in a neighborhood in I live in an agricultural area and a lot of people think that our Creek is a dump site. Um, and, and there's a lot of other trash that's left around here. Um, and so I've found that an important part of my practice has been cleaning up the trash, you know, getting it out of the Creek, trying to get the plastic out of the waterway so that it doesn't go down again into the ocean. And I guess it's been a, it's been, I mean, there's sometimes there's just, you know, how could people do this? I mean, and some of the stuff they leave is pretty horrible, but, um, but, but, but the just choosing to clean it up and, and, and wishing well to the, whoever did this has been a, has been a really liberating practice for me. So, so I just wanted to share that. Yeah, and I appreciate you doing your part and supporting and protecting this earth. And that's just the first precept. So thank you. Thank you, Judith. I think we have time for maybe one more question. OK. 
Okay, that would be from Jack. Jack, if you could, un yeah. Yes, I did. One, one, hi. Hi, Jack. One of the teachings that really resonated was standing in the middle. Mm. And also was aware of how, as powerful as that is, how far I am from that. Uh, so my question is, what can I do? What practice is there to help uh, me be able to, or anybody be able to stand in the middle when all this is going on? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that question. You know, in, in my personal experience, I find that when my practice is quiet and alone and on my cushion, it doesn't, it's not really alive for me the way that it is when I'm out and engaging in the world. And so I always give people this, <laughs> this instruction. I'm like, if you really want to test your practice, go to a news channel that you don't like and see what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> my girlfriend who does not have a practice so this is what we do and I think I have a really strong practice I think that like my ethics and you know and I sit down and I watch Fox News and it all goes out the window and so it's my practice I put myself in the fire and I see what I'm made of <laughs> you know and I see what I'm made of and it's been really extraordinary. And something that I, that I started doing a few years ago, you know, again, I grew up in a Republican household. And so I grew up like fighting with my dad around politics. So this is not a new world for me. <laughs> and I remember my dad always would say things like, you know, you know, well, Reagan's the one who put braces on your teeth and Reagan's the one who's paying for your college tuition. And Reagan's the one who's putting a roof over your head. And what I understood was that my father's first priorities were making sure that his family was taken care of, that we were safe, that we had everything that we needed. And my dad being a Navy guy, Reagan really took care of the military. And so Reagan was, you know, um, laid the means to an end. And so when I'm watching all that's been happening in the world and I'm like, what is going on? I pause and I'm like, oh, they're trying to take care of their people. They're trying to take care of their loved ones. And, and I might not believe or um, the ways that they are doing it, I might not be in alignment with, you know? We have different access points or how they were taking care, taking care of people is different than how I would take care of people. But if I can look and see the fundamental, oh, they're, they're looking after their own. They're protecting their own. They want to make sure that, that their privilege and their access and their positionality is preserved. And we all do that to a certain extent. How do I keep, you know, my, my position, you know? And so I take away all the rhetoric and all like the noise and all like the, the just, I'm just gonna call it the noise, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, what's underneath that? What's underneath that? And it allows me to come a little bit closer towards compassion. And what it does more importantly is that it doesn't allow me to hate, right? Because when I'm like, Mm, mm. you know I've let greed hatred and delusion colonize my heart and so when I'm doing this to who I don't agree to I'm also doing this to all the beauty and love and 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 relationship that I can be bringing into my life and so do I want that you know Thank you so much for that beautiful question. And so dear ones, um, this is our time, my time for the evening. And what we do for those of you who are near to this evening and, and who are new to this evening and those of you who've been around the set, um, there's time for you all to break into small groups um, and to discuss further. 
And so the questions I want to leave you with is, how is your practice showing up off the cushion? How is your practice showing up off the cushion? Are you full of love and bliss and kumbaya and so much compassion when you're sitting alone with your eyes closed and having inward experience? And the second you turn on the news or the second you hear something that you don't agree with, what happens to your practice? So how can we continue to cultivate our practice even in relationship with those experiences and people and circumstances that feel challenging to us. So thank you so much for your kind attention this evening. And for those who wish to stay and go into the breakout groups, really have a good time and, and get into this. And if your questions were not answered, feel free to reach out to me. You can find me at lesliebooker.com and, and send me a message. I'm happy to be in conversation. So thank you so much for your evening, for this, for being with me this evening. And I'll be back on December 9th.